All right. I told the folks in Milwaukee last night that I seldom use a microphone. Can you hear me just fine? Yes? Okay, good. These things drive me crazy. I, I move around too much for a microphone to, to have effect. So, um, like Jim said, uh, uh, well, let me at first um, thank Jim for his uh, carting me all over town and taking me places, and I really appreciate it. It's been a great tour guide, um, and even put up with my stupidity at the airport, not getting in the right place, but we, we managed. I don't know, she sent you there. Yeah, I was sent there, that's right. That's what, that's what happens when you listen to an airport employee. Archer's waiting for me to pick her up at arrival. <laughs> now, someone told, they, you know, I asked someone in uniform, right? That's what we do. Welcome we, to Chicago. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Chicago. On the coldest day of the year. Yeah, and it was cold, true. Uh, give me a little background about myself. I uh, went to college, I went to junior college, Crowder College there in Neosho. Neosho is about 50 miles south of Springfield. Um, an interesting fact about Crowder, it was a POW uh, camp during World War II, had German prisoners there. Um, so spent two years there, played a little softball. Uh, then I went to Missouri, what was Missouri Southern State College, it's uh, State University now, I don't know what they call it now. I uh, got my bachelor's degree. Didn't really know what I was going to do with a bachelor's degree in history. Had gone, uh, taken all the exams for joining the Air Force. I just had to go take my physical. And one of my professors said, hey, have you ever thought about graduate school? Huh? Sure. Um, so she was able to get me into Pittsburgh State, where she was also, she graduated from Pittsburgh State. So I spent two years being called a Missouri puke um, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Um, but got to work with one of the premier scholars, in, in my opinion, on African Americans in the Civil War, Dudley Taylor Cornish. Um, so got to work with Dudley, who was, if you've ever had the chance to meet Dudley, he was one, one of a kind. Um, then I was at, still in school and got a, a phone call from the National Park Service. I'd turned in my application um, to come work at Independence Hall in Philadelphia at the GS4 level. Now, if you know anything about the pay scale, that's not, that's not much. <laughs> um, so I did an hour-long phone interview and had verbally accepted that position. Went home for spring break. Of course, it was all contingent on passing comprehensive exams. Went home, came back. I was working as a GA for the history department and got a phone call from the Midwest Regional Office, which is located in Omaha, Nebraska. I said, hey, why don't you come work for us at the GS9 level? Well, it took about that long. Um, you know, mama didn't raise no fool. You know? uh, well, there's my brother, but we won't talk about him. Uh, so I went to work for the Park Service. I graduated in, in May, went to work for them in June of 91. Um, I got in on the ground floor of a program called the American Battlefield Protection Program. Uh, all the folks in the office in Omaha used to give me a hard time because my maiden name is Slaughter. <laughs> Slaughter, Battlefield. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, exactly, Slaughter Pin. So that's how um, I started my career at the Park Service. My first, uh, I was there for a week. My second week on the job, uh, I went to Washington, D.C. Now, keep in mind, I'm this still wet behind the ears, kid just fresh out of graduate school. I'd never been on an airplane before, okay, let alone going to our nation's capital. So they were sending me to Washington, D.C. to meet all the folks with the battlefield program and to have a meeting with the chief historian, who at the time happened to be a man by the name of Ed Bars. <laughs> so uh, I, met with all, I met with all the folks I needed to, and I went to Ed's office at the uh, appointed time, and. Fortunately, my father raised me right in that uh, it, you are not, if I'm to be there at 9 o'clock, I'm there by 8.45, okay? If you're not 15 minutes early, then you're late. So I was there early. They took me into Ed's office, introduced myself, and he wanted to know where I was from. So I told him, and he looked at me, and he said, have you been to Newtonia? Just about like that. You know, I'm already shaking in my boots, all right? I said, yes, sir, I have, and I, you know, I've been there several times, I know the folks there, he's like, all right then, and I, he's liked me ever since, I don't know, right, so, 
you know, it's, it's that old adage, it's not what you know, but who, right? But uh, Ed, Ed is a national treasure. Uh, when we lose him, we will, we will lose a wealth of knowledge. He has probably forgotten more about the Civil War than all of us in this room combined will ever know. Uh, he, he's a one of a kind. I made some travel arrangements for him uh, once upon a moon, and I called his house. And this was before Margie, his wife, had died. And uh, I said, you know, we got everything arranged, and she was talking affectionately about Ed. And I said, Margie, you know, I, I just have one question. This was before I was married. I said, you and Ed have been married a long time. I said, uh, what's your secret? How does that work? There was a pause on the other end of the phone. Now, Margie is a, a nice southern lady. Pause on the other end of the phone, and she said, he travels a lot. <laughs> Note to self. But that, that's all free. I won't charge you for any of that. Uh, we'll uh, talk about the battle of and for Wilson's Creek. How many of you have been to Wilson's Creek? Several years ago, you guys came on a tour uh, to Wilson's Creek with Ed. Um, 2002, thank you. Um, and I, I think I was in the field a little with you at that point. Um, my husband got to meet Ed for the first time, and you know, there's, there's nothing like scoring points with your husband when you get to sit at the same table at dinner with Ed Bars. You know, he, that lasted for about six months. I had brownie points, it was great. <laughs> So Ed was, uh, just a side note, Ed did the original boundary survey for the Battle of Wilson's Creek, uh, for the, the battlefield itself. So let's talk a little about Missouri. Uh, anyone able to identify this gentleman? Jim, you don't count because you saw this last night. Governor Cleborn Fox Jackson. That is correct. So in the 1860s, Jackson is the governor of Missouri at the time. He is originally from Virginia, very pro-Southern leanings. Um, what folks don't realize, a lot of folks, is that Missouri has a secession convention just like uh, those rebels in South Carolina, uh, in the Deep South. We have a secession convention, but we vote to not secede from the Union. Didn't make Jackson very happy, okay? Uh, he didn't want to fight against his fellow Virginians. But what really tipped the scales in Missouri which is not unusual for a lot of border states, is when Lincoln issues a call for troops, pardon me, to suppress the rebellion. That really made Missourians make a stand or, or figure out what side they really were on. So Jackson, of course, isn't going to supply any troops um, to fight against the South. He appoints this gentleman, <laughs> Sterling Price, um, affectionately known as Pap, to his men. Um, Price is a former governor of the state of Missouri, very popular, um, also uh, from Virginia. He appoints Price as the commander of the Missouri State Guard, what we would know as uh, the National Guard today uh, for the state. These men are fighting for the state of Missouri. Now, being a native from, of Missouri, I can say this, we tend to be a stubborn lot. We don't like either side telling us what to do. We didn't want the federal government or the confederate government telling us what we could or could not do. Um, you can ask my husband if that's still true today, which is it is. So once he appoints Price to head the Missouri State Guard, Price starts to train these men. Um, but unfortunately for them, they're going to meet up with a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Lyon. Now Lyon is in the Union Army, the professional soldier, um, he had been involved in some of the border conflict between Kansas and Missouri. Very ardent abolitionist. Folks would even would say Lyon was either uh, a very good leader or kind of out of his out of his head. A very strict disciplinarian with a fiery redhead. Uh, Jim and I had this conversation about redheads today. Um, fiery redhead. Uh, military discipline at the time was harsh to say the least. But Lyon took that even one step further when he was punishing his men for some minor offense. The Lyon is who Price and Jackson are going to deal with in the state of Missouri. So they have a meeting at what is called the Planter's House in St. Louis. 
trying to come to some type of compromise. One of the most famous lines from our film that we use all the time, when no compromise could be reached, the lion says, rather than concede for one single instant, the right to dictate to my government in any matter, however unemployment, unimportant, I would see every man, woman, and child in the state dead and buried. This means war. Uh, I don't think they would call him the great compromiser by any way, shape, or form. <laughs> so Jackson and Price retreat from Boonville and St. Louis. They retreat down to the southwest corner of the state, close to where I'm from, close to Neosho, to a spot called Cowskin Prairie, where Price begins to train his men. Um, a lot of them are carrying the smoothbore musket that they had over the mantle, if they have a weapon. Okay? And he begins to drill them and to train them, and they would eventually clash with Nathaniel Lyon at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. We have another player that comes into play, um, General Ben McCullough. McCullough is a regular Confederate officer. He's originally uh, from Texas. He's a former Texas Ranger. Um, what strikes me as odd about McCullough is that in August in Missouri, it's generally not very cool. Um, pretty hot and humid. McCullough on the day of, of the Battle of Wilson's Creek is wearing a black velvet suit. Now, I've been out in, in Missouri in August in wool, and it's not pleasant. I'm pretty sure the black velvet suit wasn't the right choice, but that's what he chose to wear. So McCullough comes up from Arkansas with regular Confederate troops as well as Arkansas State troops, and they camp along Wilson's Creek. I have a lot of, I do a lot of school group presentations. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, how many school groups we get. Um, and the first question a lot of them ask is, why did they fight here? Um, we have people who come in the front desk. Why are all these Civil War battlefields at national parks? <laughs> well, here's your sign. Um, so the school kids ask, you know, why did they fight here? Well, the main reason is there's water. Um, you have, uh, with McCullough and Price's armies joining together, they have about 12,000 men. And with those men, they have mules and horses that have to be fed and watered. There's not only Wilson's Creek, although I wouldn't drink out of Wilson's Creek today, but you could then. And there's all kinds of springs in the area. And there's all these farms as well. Um, so they were able to be there right about harvest time. So there's plenty to eat. So that's why they actually camp there days in advance before the battle. Lion, on the other hand, has about... Uh, 5,400 men when he begins to march on Wilson's Creek. Now, he decides to listen to a gentleman. <clears throat> yes, Ron Siegel. Uh, that I have, I, I'm really trying to be nice this trip. It, it's, <clears throat> it's hard for me when it comes to Franz. Um, Franz Siegel is, a prominent, is prominent in the German community at the time. Now, Franz had been involved in the revolutions of 1848 in what was then called Prussia. Let's just say he wasn't on the winning side. And it's, he has two choices. Uh, leave the country, immigrate somewhere else, anywhere else, or a hangman's noose. Well, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty easy choice. So he immigrates to the United States, he settles in St. Louis, and becomes very active in the local community a lot of immigrants settle in St. Louis because of the waterways. The Mississippi and the Missouri bring a lot of uh, immigrants to settle there. And he starts what you and I would call a Rotary Club or even a Civil War Roundtable, a gathering of like minds, and they do a little drill, you know, military drill. So when Lincoln issues the call for troops, Siegel is one of the first uh, with military experience, and it, we probably should have checked his resume a little closer, but he has made a colonel and assigned to Lyon's staff, and he brings a lot of this German population with him. They, they enlist and they want to prove their worth to their new country. So, and a lot of the commands that Siegel gives at the Battle of Wilson's Creek are given in German. So Siegel brings these folks with him, and he convinces Lyon to divide his force. Now remember, 
The Southerners have about 12,000. Lyon has about 5,400. Now, I majored in history for a reason. The numbers do not change. Okay? And they don't throw in letters with the numbers for in that algebra stuff. <laughs> so, I, I don't do math. But even I know that 12,054, that, there's a big difference. Lyon is outnumbered. And Siegel convinces him to divide his force. And he's going to send men under Siegel to what we call the, the south end or the rear of the field. And they're going to trap the southerners between them in this great pincher movement, which on paper looks phenomenal. <laughs> if only Siegel had been better. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was not. So he divides the force, and Siegel's cue to advance is when he hears Lyon open his artillery on what becomes known as Bloody Hill, or the Oak Hills. It takes the high ground. Siegel hears that on the morning of August 10th. Well, let me, let me back up one step. I don't know why I have notes, because I don't use them. On the evening of August 9th, it starts to rain. The Southerners were going to advance into Springfield and attack the Union Army there. But a lot of the men had cloth haversacks, or their ammunition was in their pocket. Now, if you know anything about black powder, if it gets wet, it's useless. So the decision was made not to advance into Springfield to attack the Union Army. Then they made one fatal error. They didn't put pickets out. So Lyon, that Lyon and his men were able to advance on the southern camp almost undetected till it was almost too late. So, you know, I blame it on it's early in the war. Okay? War starts in April. This battle is fought in August of 1861. Although Price and McCullough both have military experience from the Mexican War and should have known better. But pickets were not put out. So Lyon advances... Uh, early in the morning, they march out from Springfield. It's only about 10 miles, but I'd rather take it in my car as opposed to watch it, walking. They advance out onto the field, and Lyon takes the high ground. He knew what he was doing, took the military, um, very sound strategy militarily, and takes the high ground. Siegel hears Lyon's uh, artillery open up. That's his cue to advance. And he does really well. He pushes the Confederate forces in front of him. Um, he awakens a sleeping camp. His men come down through from the, from the hills, down through the field, an open cornfield uh, owned by a man by the name of Sharp. And the Confederates are set to flight. Um, yes, the Confederates are set to flight. Siegel's men, they stop and they're raiding everybody's camp. They haven't had breakfast. You know, they were cooking breakfast, so they're taking food and eating. They move forward until Siegel blocks the wire road, or the telegraph wire road. That's the main thoroughfare through the battlefield. McCullough hears of this, and he sends what, what we call his, the shock troops of the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Um, sorry, I skipped the slide. This is uh, Bloody Hill. Siegel is coming from over here, the high ground. And Lyon has his force this way on Bloody Hill. So Siegel gets, you know, he advances, he moves all the way, he blocks the wire road. McCullough finds out about this and he sends his shock troops, men from Louisiana and Missouri, to come up what I would call a draw, uh, come up the hill and attack this position. Well, Siegel sees the men coming. They're clad in gray uniforms and they're coming up the, the wire road to attack his position. Well, you and I would think, well, duh. <laughs> They're clad in gray uniforms. You should know better. It's August. There is no blue or gray. Okay? Not yet. The night before, Siegel had camped next to the 1st Iowa. A 90-day enlistee group that were eager to see the elephant, so to speak, half of whom were clad in blue uniforms, the other half in gray. By the time Siegel realizes his mistake, it's too late. They overrun his position, and Siegel's the first guy back to Springfield. <laughs> Hence the reason I don't have much respect for him. I think we always say he had dinner reservations. Yeah. He makes his way back to Springfield. 
Um, he's the first one and leaves his men to literally fend for themselves. He loses a couple of artillery pieces. Now some of his men actually do re regroup, bless you, uh, regroup and actually make a stand, but for the most part his men are set to flight. Lion is on Bloody Hill, what becomes known as Bloody Hill, excuse me, Oak Hill, called that by the locals. Of course, this is the Battle of Oak Hills to the southern uh, folks. So now he was outnumbered two to one, now it's at least three to one. And he has his line on Bloody Hill. He knew what he was doing. He had anchored his line on either end with artillery and in the middle. His artillery commander was a man by the name of James Totten. Totten had a unique nickname. I always wanted a cool nickname when I was playing sports. I never got one, but I always wanted one. Totten's nickname was Bottlenose. It had nothing to do with the shape of his nose, but everything to do with the flask that he kept in his pocket. Okay? So before the war, Totten had been an artillery instructor at the Little Rock Arsenal in Little Rock, Arkansas. When Arkansas secedes from the Union, Totten remains loyal, comes back to St. Louis, and is a, a, assigned to Lyon's staff, and becomes his, his artillery chief. A, a artillery battery is raised out of the Little Rock Arsenal. It just happens to be in Pulaski County. So they're called the Pulaski Light Artillery, commanded by a man by the name of Woodruff. And they fight at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. You have student versus teacher. Well, needless to say, the teacher got the better end of the deal. Um, but it's one of those unique stories where in the Trans-Mississippi in particular, you're more likely to look across the field and, and know that person or be related to that person that you're fighting against. So you have that teacher versus student aspect here at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. So they've been fighting since about 5.30 in the morning. Lion's been wounded a couple of times, had a horse shot out from underneath him. Uh, when he decides that he is going to lead a charge of Kansas troops, he waves his sword in the air, follow me, my brave boys, and I will lead you. When he's mortally wounded in the chest. This is a, a print by Kurtz and Allison um, showing Lion um, being wounded right here where he falls off the horse. His aide, a man by the name of Lehman, helps him pull, you know, pulls him down off the horse. Lion's famous last words, I am killed. I don't know, I think I could have come up with something better. <laughs> hey, they shot me, you know, something. Anyway, so Lion is instantly is, is killed. And they put, drag his body off to the side, high under, back behind a tree. You know, you don't, want the, you don't want your troops to know that their commander has been killed. And this gentleman takes command. Samuel Sturgis is the highest ranking officer who has not been wounded on the Union side. So Lyon is killed about 9.30 in the morning. They've been fighting for five and a half, almost six hours. It, it's August in Missouri. It's hot. A record heat wave. The temperature was over 100 degrees. They're running low on ammunition. The commander is dead. And the decision is made by Sturgis to retreat back to Springfield. Now, when I first came to Wilson's Creek, I had a hard time understanding why the Southerners didn't just advance up Bloody Hill and just blow Lion out of the water. There were more of them. Whether they were armed or not made no difference. There were just more of them. And I had it explained to me that the attacks were more like an octopus. So the southern army would come up the hill and attack. Lion would be able to shift his men to meet that onslaught. Then the southern army would retreat down the hill. Then they would come and attack in another area. Lion would move his men and, and meet that onslaught. So it wasn't an all-out like Pickett's Charge, this one big line that advanced over an area and attacked all at once. Now in Missouri, we don't have a hill that goes up and comes down. It's a hill that comes up, kind of levels off a little, goes up a little more, levels off a little, goes up a little more. 
So when they would retreat, they could reach an area where they could recover. All right? So when the Southerners advance up Bloody Hill for the third time, they discover, wait, there's no one here. The Union Army had retreated back to Springfield. So it is a Southern victory, six hours on an August morning. The casualties for six hours killed, missing, and wounded from both sides, over 2,500 men. That's pretty high. At the time of the Battle of Wilson's Creek, it was the largest land action ever fought on United States soil. Now, that's quickly surpassed by other battles uh, of the Civil War. But remember, everyone thought the war would be over in six months. I don't want to miss it. That's why you have a lot of men who signed up 90-day enlistees. Little did they know that the war is going to last uh, four bloody years. Okay? So... Sturgis makes the decision to retreat back to Springfield. The Southerners retain the field, and they take care of the dying and the wounded. They find Lion's body is originally put in a wagon to take back to Springfield with them, but there are so many wounded that they take his body back out of the wagon and leave it on the field. Remember, it's early 61. There is no medical corps yet. Neither side is prepared for the number of wounded. Local physicians from Springfield come out to the field to care for the wounded, if you can actually call them doctors. I mean, there were medical schools at the time, but their practices weren't anything like we have today. I mean, their solution to uh, feeling ill was to bleed you, okay, to get rid of that bad blood. The Civil War teaches them a, an unbelievable amount about wounds and how to treat them. <clears throat> so Lion's body brought to the Ray house. John and Roxanna Ray live in this house. Serves as a field hospital. It's one of two structures that still stand at the battlefield. The Union Army uh, gets a message saying, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, you guys forgot something here on the field. So they come back under, under a flag of truce and pick up Lion's body. Take it into Springfield to the home of John and Mary Phelps. Now, John Phelps is a colonel in the Union Army. He's in Arkansas at the time. And Mary Phelps really thinks that the Southerners are going to come into Springfield and try to desecrate the body. They're going to try to do something bad to Lyon's body. So she has a pine coffin built for it, buries it in her backyard. The next day, when the Union Army retreats from Springfield to Rolla, which is where the railroad is located, about two and a half hours, give or take, by car from Springfield, guess where they leave Lyon's body? at the home of John and Mary Phelps. Lyon's family comes from Connecticut. Connecticut, Missouri, takes a while, okay? So they come by rail to Rolla, from Rolla to Springfield in a wagon. It's about a month later. So I don't know, does anybody recognize the name Doug Scott? Doug has done uh, tremendous work, used to work for the Park Service on battlefield archeology. span and Doug was at the park, and I asked him, I said, so, so what did Lion's body look like? <laughs> and he gave me some big long word, you know, and I said, I'm just a girl from the hills of southwest Missouri. You're going to have to simplify it a bit. He said, you know, when you're in the summertime and you're standing on the uh, tar asphalt uh, parking lot, and, and you go to lift your foot, and it kind of sticks, I said, okay, now you have a visual for a lion's body. It's great to tell school kids that right after lunch. <laughs> so they do for Lyon what is done for Lincoln in 1865 when he's assassinated. Lyon is the first Union general killed in combat during the Civil War. And they drape his train in black and whistle stops are made all along, all the way to Connecticut to honor him. And people come out by the thousands to honor Lyon for being first. Now, what they don't tell you is that right before this battle, Lyon's a captain. Have any veterans in the room? Where do captains lead their men from? The front, right? Right before this battle, Lyon is promoted to Brigadier General. He just happens to know Francis Blair, who is a very large uh, political figure in the state of Missouri. 
Francis happens to have a brother named Montgomery who just so happens to be Lincoln's postmaster general. Again, it's not what you know, but who. Lyon is promoted to general before the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Generals lead their men from where? The rear. Okay, Lyon didn't get the memo. And he, he is killed leading his men from the front. So, you know, we, we play historical what-ifs all the time. What if, what if Lyon had got the memo and had been in the rear? Would things have changed? I don't know. I can't rewrite history. Uh, Lyon didn't get the memo. That's the fact. And he was killed at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. So the Battle of Wilson's Creek takes six hours on a hot August morning. Lyon achieves his objective of keeping the Southerners from advancing. The regular Confederate army under Ben McCullough, after the Battle of Wilson's Creek, retreats back to, to Arkansas. Sterling Price takes the Missouri State Guard and goes to Lexington, Missouri, where he wins a resounding victory at Lexington, at the Battle of the Hemp Bales. Um, they were smoking hemp back then. Um, <laughs> Boy, I'm glad somebody laughed. I've been using that one and no one laughed. So, um, they, they used hemp bells for protection to advance um, there at Lexington. So the Confederacy is doing really well in 61. You know, Bull Run, Wilson's Creek, Lexington, those were all big victories. But the Battle of Wilson's Creek, six short hours and it's over. But the Battle for Wilson's Creek is just beginning. Shortly after... Um, the Battle of Wilson's Creek, just four months after the battle, on December 24th, 1861, Congress passed a joint resolution honoring Lyon and all who had fought at Wilson's Creek. This was one of only five that are passed through the entire war. After the war's end, veterans began coming to Wilson's Creek uh, to honor their fallen comrades. We have a couple of very large reunions. The last is in 1897. And they start building this rock carn. So they would etch their names in the rock. You can look, if you look really close, you can see some of the names here. And they place them in the spot where they remember Lion falling. But for his mortally, being mortally wounded. In 1928, the University Club puts up a, a monument in that spot. Unfortunately, there are none of those rocks remain from when the soldiers put them up. It's a great bureaucratic marker. At or near this spot. That could be anywhere. But fortunately for us, this is the only marker that's on the field. So we're able to restore the battlefield to what it did look like in 1861. So fortunately for us, a local group of citizens decided that this was a good thing to commemorate, to, to honor those that had fallen and to preserve this battlefield. Um, this gentleman right here, John Holston, um, Dr. Metter over here, a history professor, they did their homework and they lobbied, they, they actually bought the first 37 acres of what becomes Nat Wilson's Creek National Battlefield. Then they lobbied the state of Missouri to buy the rest, about 1,750 acres. But once that was done, then they decided to, you know, that's not enough. Let's lobby the federal government and make this a part of the National Park Service. Well, a couple of years before, uh, we become a park in 1960, and a couple of years before that, Pea Ridge had come in as a national park. Now, for those of you who don't know, to become a part of the National Park Service, it takes an act of Congress. Okay? So, we had Pea Ridge. <sighs> Nothing happened in the Trans-Mississippi. We don't need another national battlefield out there. Um, Ed Bars did the original boundary survey, survey, not only for Pea Ridge, but for Wilson's Creek as well. And just as an aside, if we had listened to Ed's original boundary survey, we wouldn't be buying land today. Um, we would have already had it. Okay. So these men did not give up and lobbied the federal government until we became a national park. President Eisenhower signed the legislation in 1960. We have our first uh, nice little signs here um, for headquarters and our first visitor center. <laughs> now, remember this because it, it'll be important in just a few minutes. This was our first visitor center. Uh, we had two staff 
a maintenance employee and an interpreter. Um, the superintendent was the superintendent from George Washington Carver. It was a dual administration. Okay? We finally separated from George Washington Carver in the 70s. In the early 80s, we finally got money to build a nice visitor center. Um, inside the visitor center, if those of you who have been there before, we have a 28-minute film now that was done by Wide Awake Films. And this nice eight-minute diorama that shows you who moved where. This is Ed's favorite thing at the battlefield, by the way. Um, we always have to show the map for Ed. Um, and we have military troops that still use this today. We have staff rides from Fort Wood uh, that come down and use the the sand table, as they call it. So after we become a park in 1960, um, this house, the Ray House, is still occupied by a private citizen. Right here, outside this fence, is the wire road. It was a county road at the time. People were driving right back, back and forth, right in front of the Ray House. The last resident of the house was a lady by the name of Bessie McElhaney. When she moved out, in 1966, which was a really good year, by the way. <clears throat> if you can't figure that out, it's the year I was born, okay? When she moved out, we became the caretakers of the house. And the first thing we did was put a fence up. And then we were able to get money eventually from the National Park Service to restore the house to what it would have looked like in 1861. There was an addition back here a big back room as well as on this side of the house and some outbuildings that we were able to take off and restore the house. Now, John Ray was showing off when he built this house. It's not your typical homestead in Missouri. It's made, the siding is ponderosa pine. It doesn't grow native in Missouri. Someone probably ordered it, came to Springfield and John Ray got the leftovers. He's a postmaster. Okay, so he's a federal employee just like I am, yet he has slaves. So you have that weird position of Missouri uh, where you, you have a, a union man or being paid by the federal government and yet he still owns slaves. He has real glass in his windows. Uh, so he was showing off his wealth a bit. Knew what he was doing when he built here because he built right by the wire road. All traffic, military and civilian, goes right by his front porch. Butterfield Overland Stage. Goes right by his front porch. Uh, you could get on the stage here at the Ray House. So he knew what he was doing when he built there. Again, one of two structures that still remain, the Ray House and then the Ray Spring House. I have school kids ask all the time, the Spring House is down by the spring. Okay. Um, so well, what, well, what do they use that for? So that's their refrigerator. That's where they kept their milk and you know anything that would perish. That's where they kept it. <gasps> Well, why is it so far from the house? Well, that's where the spring's at. Um, you know, it's a difficult uh, concept to get into school kids' minds today. Uh, you know, kids have their own room and their TV and their phone and their computer and their, you know, the list goes on. Um, when you look at this house, I mean, you have John and Roxana Ray and nine children plus Rhoda, their slave, and four of her children that live in this house. So they, they have no concept of that. So it's another story that we get to tell. 2003, we added this half of the building. This is the John Holston Research Library. Remember John Holston before, one of the original members that helped make, you know, lobby the federal government to make us a national park. We have, I, I can't, I don't have the documentation to back this up, but I would dare say we have the largest research library in the National Park Service. Now I can say without hesitation we have the largest research library on the Trans-Mississippi most definitely. Um, it, it's an incredible resource. Ed describes uh, the Battle of Wilson's Creek and the resources we have as a three-legged stool. So you have the battlefield itself, that's one leg. You have the written documentation, that's another leg. And then you have the artifacts. So in 2005, we were able to purchase a private collection that was collected by Dr. Tom and Karen Sweeney. Tom spent his entire life collecting Civil War artifacts. They had one-of-a-kind items. For instance, uh, 
Cherokee Braves flag that was carried by General Stan Wadey, uh, the only Native American to reach the rank of uh, Major General during the war. Things like uh, Patrick Claiborne, that name ring a bell? Patrick Claiborne's sword belt and sash that he was wearing when he was killed at the Battle of Franklin in 1864. So you and I, as taxpayers, purchased all of that in 2005, plus the 20 acres that the museum building and their house sat on to provide a buffer zone for the, for the park. We just paid about $4 million for that. Now, if Karen and Tom really had wanted to make money, they had piecemealed the collection and could have made five, six times that. But they wanted the collection to stay together and wanted it to stay at Wilson's Creek to tell the complete story of the Battle of Wilson's Creek and the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Um, then in, uh, see, what year did we do the Bloody Hill Wayside? In 2012, we had, the Park Service is famous for our nice waysides. Uh, the waysides on Bloody Hill had been there since we became a park. So needless to say, they were a little out of date. So we were able to put all new waysides on Bloody Hill, and we highlighted some of the immigrants that fought. Uh, Solikowski, he's from Poland. Okay, this is Totten's battery in the middle, here, where Totten makes his stand on these four pieces, the anchor of the Union line. So we're able to update those, finally. Then in uh, 2016, I had to stop and think, what year? The exhibits that were in the visitor center were in the visitor center when it was built in 1980. So we're able to redo all of the exhibits, and it took longer to do these exhibits than it did to fight the war. <laughs> we had... Unfortunately for, unfortunately for us, a firm from the East Coast was, who was awarded the contract. And you know as well as I do that the war in the East and the war in the Trans-Mississippi are completely different. And it took a lot of education and browbeating um, to get that in their heads. So that's why the process took so long. And we really emphasized the communities in the area. Um, back, oops, sorry, back here. Back here we have uh, the political leaders, the African American community, the Native American community. It takes all of those, and all of those were impacted by what happened here on August 10th, 1861. Um, we kept the map here, and all of this is Wilson's Creek specific. It, it re receives the highlight, so to speak, of, of the displays. We do lots of things at the battlefield. Now, if you look closely at this picture, you should recognize someone. Do you? How about, how about this person back here? Look, look familiar? Yes, that would be me. And uh, that's, those, are sergeant, those are sergeant stripes, thank you very much. Well, I got folders in my so a few years ago, uh, about two years ago now, our historic weapons person retired. And they needed someone to go spend two weeks in lovely Anniston, Alabama, and become the historic weapons supervisor. And I said, well, okay, why not? So I went um, and had a lot more fun than I thought I would. And I'm now the historic weapons supervisor. Uh, that's a 12-pound piece, by the way, that we get to fire. This year... Uh, this past year in December, we have a luminary tour where we put up the luminaries, one for every killed, missing, and wounded during the battle, and we were able to fire the artillery at night. Um, it, it's a lot of fun to make the cannon go boom normally, but at night, it's even better because you can see, you can see the, the flame here, and you can see it come out of the vent as well. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a cool deal. And... I'm the sergeant, so I get to tell all these guys what to do. <laughs> we provide cavalry demonstrations, uh, infantry demonstrations. This is the 3rd Louisiana. If you ever get a chance to see uh, the 3rd Louisiana do their interpretation, um, they are well worth it. Uh, these gentlemen take on the persona of a man who actually fought in that unit. 
and the 3rd Louisiana was at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, and they do a fine job. Um, also, their founder of the unit, Robert Serio, makes the best brogans in the business. He's, yeah. he's a good guy. So from March to the end of May, we have what's called yellow fever. <coughs> they descend upon us. And we'll have anywhere from five to 8,000 school kids in that time frame. No one gets annual leave during, from March to May. Unless, you know, even sick leave. You better be dying and in the hospital to get it approved. Um, we, allow, we have lots of different programs for them. We have the tour of the Ray House. We do Civil War Medicine, Common Soldier Program. Um, they, of course, have their picnic lunch. Um, we have other folks who come out and ride their bicycles. We have a five-mile tour road. So people enjoy things differently. Um, they ride their, ride their bicycles. We have seven miles of horse trail. People come out and ride their horses. And by the way, it's BYOH. <laughs> Bring your own horse. Right. Um, they come out and ride, especially during hunting season, because it's a safe place for them to ride. And to me, it doesn't matter one iota why you come to Wilson's Creek. Whether you come to ride your horse, whether you come for exercise to run five miles, which I don't know why anyone in their right mind would run five miles. The only time you're going to catch me running is if I can't beat up the person chasing me. But it doesn't matter to me why you come. Once you are there, it's my job to tell you why six hours on an August morning were important in forming the country in which you now live. That's our job at the National Park Service. So I, I made the remark earlier that if we'd listened to Ed to begin with, we wouldn't be buying land today. Um, this is a prime example. This is a Double Springs area. It's across ZZ Highway from Bloody Hill actually probably was part of the Union line. So the Civil War Trust actually helped us purchase this land. It has double springs. Water is a prime commodity. Both sides used this area. Has a portion of the wire road. It also has the Gwynn Farm, which is where a portion of Siegel's men actually gathered, uh, and regrouped, and actually fought, made a stand. Uh, several years ago, the City of Republic decided Hey, I know the best place for our new high school. A mile down the road from Wilson's Creek National Battlefield. So that's where they put it. Um, it increased the traffic on ZZ Highway by five times. You do not go through here at 7.15 in the morning. Or at 2.30 at night. Or in the afternoon. With the kids coming in and out. It really has increased the traffic as well as the noise level. And now we have decided... We got money from uh, the National Park Foundation as well as regular Park Service money to do a renovation of our visitor center. Not the exhibits that we talked about earlier, but the rest of the visitor center. The contract is supposed to be six to nine months. They started in November. This is the interior. Um, this used to be the front desk. This is all gone. They gutted the whole entire building. This is the theater which will stay. This will be uh, new restrooms. What's the first question most people ask when they come in the door of a national park? Where are the bathrooms? Even though we had this big sign that said restrooms, people still couldn't find it. So now, as soon as you come in the front door, the bathrooms are going to be the first thing that you see. Okay? And the, the front desk is going to be right over here, so we get to listen to the running water. But um, this, this hallway leads to our library. The library is down here on the opposite end. So all of this, this is a multi-purpose room, which will, nothing is happening in there. That will stay. But this will all be museum storage. This used to be offices all through here. We do not have adequate space to store our museum collection. That was the impetus that got this project started. You know, I don't want it to be said on my watch that we let something like Patrick Claiborne's sword belt and sash um, go unprotected. That wouldn't look very good on anyone's resume. So that, that was the impetus to get this started. Now remember when I showed you the trailer? Earlier, our first visitor center? This is our visitor center now. Okay, during the temporary construction 
period. And actually, I think the trailer back in the 60s was bigger than the one we have now. This is the inside. It's pretty tight. Um, this is the cash register here for both you know, the Eastern National, our bookstore. We sell our, we uh, show our film right down here. We can seat nine people <laughs> uh, for the film. The bad part about this is, do you see any windows? No. You get about five people in here and I want to get out in a hurry. I'm really not claustrophobic, but this one will get you in a hurry. But it is temporary. Hopefully the project won't take a year and a half, but we all think it might. But um, So school kids, uh, they're having a whole new experience this year because they won't be going into the visitor center. Can you imagine 30? No. No. There'd be people quitting right and left. So what else do you not see in this building? Thank you. I knew a woman would find that. There are no bathrooms in there. So we've had porta johns in our parking lot for us to use until last week. We got our very own comfort station. <laughs> yeah, very nice. So now it, it's a temporary thing. And we, we bought this, so it belongs to the park. So I told everyone once the visitor center is done, I want this down at stop number five when I do artillery programs. <laughs> so I have an office down at stop five. It, it won't happen. They'll sell it or something. I won't get to use it. Um, but Wilson's Creek is continuing to evolve and to offer new and different things to the public. Um, inside the new visitor center, We'll have artillery exhibits. We'll have uh, interactive reader rails that will show you how, uh, how the cannon was loaded and fired, um, how you would limber or unlimber a cannon, and how it would be drawn off by horses. Uh, we have what we call the gun and knife show. So we'll have all the weapons that were used at the Battle of Wilson's Creek representatives of them on display. So there's a lot of time and effort and a lot of money being spent. This project that they're doing now is over $3 million. It's not often that a park our size gets that type of budget to do this type of project. But we're pretty fortunate. You know, most folks say, well, you know, Trans-Mississippi, nothing happened out there. Well, I beg to differ. Something happened in the southwest corner of Missouri at Wilson's Creek. Not only in 1861, but today as well. Questions from anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, yes? Okay. The Ray House was originally built in 1852. So he was there when uh, John Brown just... He was in the area, yes. Uh, yeah, John Brown was never actually at Wilson's Creek. I wonder how he missed uh, Mr. Ray's house. So. We got lucky. John, John Brown didn't come to that area. Yes? Did you have another structure on the Around where we do. It's called the Edwards Cabin. It's not a historic structure. So Edwards was another local settler at the time, had a small cabin, but a subsistence farmer, much smaller than the Ray House. Then it was used as the headquarters for Price and McCullough. That's where Price and McCullough are having breakfast on the morning of August 10th when the battle starts to unfold. The Edwards Cabin survives the, the battle does not survive the war. It's burned down. Edwards goes to what is now the town of Battlefield and builds another home. Um, and as the years pass, a, a, another structure is built around it. Um, and that cabin was found in the early 70s, 1970s, and was moved to Wilson's Creek and placed in on the field. Well, we couldn't get any money from the National Park Service to do anything to the cabin because it wasn't a historic structure. So about eight years ago, our foundation said, you know, that's enough. Um, they raised the money and restored the cabin um, to what it would have looked, you know, uh, uh, similar to, and that style. Okay. So it represents the Edwards cabin and the site of the headquarters. Anyone else? Yes. Is your progress being publicized or put on a on website so we can see when your visitors are Yes. Um, I would recommend that you follow us on Facebook. 
Um, we do have a website where we're posting some pictures. Um, we've been posting lots of things on Facebook and to show that progress. Yes? This was a Confederate victory. That is correct. Why is it called the Battle of Oak Hill? Because I work for the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> We, yes, as you go as you go in the door, it does say the Battle of Oak Hills. Okay. But that's why I get the question a lot, you know, we fly a we fly the Stars and Stripes. Okay? Well, why do you fly that instead of a Confederate flag? This was a Confederate victory. Yes, you're correct. But the federal government signs my paycheck. <laughs> also, uh, is there a cemetery there? Is it... There is there is not a cemetery on the field. We do not have a national cemetery at Wilson's Creek. We have one in Springfield. So a lot of the dead <clears throat> were buried there on the field. There's a natural sinkhole on Bloody Hill and it, you know, August things start to stink pretty quick. So they dig, the Confederates dig a little deeper on the sinkholes and bury the dead, uh, most of whom are unknown. You all know that, right? That's why we have dog tags today, right? Um, after the war, 1867, they come out and disinter those bodies, reinter them at the National Cemetery in Springfield. Not just Wilson's Creek, but all the surrounding battlefields as well. And they have a large monument to Price and to Lyon at the National Cemetery. Any, yes? Any, anything else? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, curious about the, uh, the groups, the children who are coming there on mm -hmm. uh, local... Uh, from local high schools, for middle schools? Uh, we have uh, elementary and middle school for the most part. Um, and generally from the furthest we have will come from Tulsa. That's about two and a half, three hours. Most of them are local Springfield wi within a 30 to 40 minute driving radius. Yes? Uh, do you educate them on the border wars and all the mess? Well, they are middle schoolers. So educate is a trying experience. Um, but, but we try. Um, we do have in our common soldier program, we talk about the border conflict and we, we have generally have two people doing our common soldier program and we have a union soldier in gray uniform. Uh, so try to throw them, you know, make them think a little about what took place. So we try. We also go into schools as well. Donald Kilmore would, might argue that uh, the war actually started in this area. War started in 1854 and right. with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. There, there's no doubt. Civil War comes along and gives, gives us an excuse to kill each other legally. Yeah. Yes? Do we have one book to recommend out of the Battle of Wilson's Creek? Which one would you recommend? The Piston Hatcher book, The Battle of Wilson's Creek and the Men Who Fought It. Hands down. If you want the complete picture. If you want the military, social, and uh, political context, that's the one. You want strictly military? Ed Barr's book on the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Yes, ma'am. Was there much uh, guerrilla activity in that part of Missouri? <laughs> that, that is a loaded question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, a lot of guerrilla activity. Not in 1861. Okay. After 1861, there is not a large Confederate army presence in the state of Missouri until Price comes back in 1864. In the time in between, you better know your neighbor and their loyalties because if they're different than yours, you best be careful. I mean, it was a very nasty place to live. Missouri, Kansas, and even into Northwest Arkansas. Lots of guerrilla warfare. Bloody Bill Anderson, um, Quantrell, you know, all of those guys are in that area. James. The James boys, the Youngers. Frank James actually fights at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Um, but all those names are familiar and they are of the Southern persuasion. That does not mean that there weren't Union men who were just as bad. Because there were. John Reynolds comes to mind. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, did it, because they don't have to die too young, did anyone continue his work, his educational work? 
in what regard? Um, not to my knowledge, our, our foundation, the Wilson's Creek National Battlefield Foundation, has a two-week summer camp for kids on the field at Wilson's Creek. Other than that, I don't know. And my comment uh, uh, is, is, is this. It's great to see the work that's been done there. You give a great presentation. I commend you for that. Uh, it reminds me of seeing Vicksburg in 19, 1980. And they had a trailer left at there. But, and also, and this isn't too self-serving uh, for the ladies who always tell me that I need to get more books on female participation in the Civil War. It's great to see you here giving us this fabulous uh, presentation. And also, we know lots of Civil War uh, historians. Uh, I had to write them down so I can remember. Jim Ogden, Will, Will Green, and Dennis Fry, my good mm -hmm. friend, Terry Winchell. Mm -hmm. These are all fabulous people, all trained by Ed. Yes. Ed's boys, and Frank O'Reilly. Uh, it's great to see a female uh, park historian here with us. And we hope to see you again someday out on the battlefield. We'll come out and see you. I, I'd be happy to do a tour. I, I would love it. Um, thank you very much. Um, anytime my name is mentioned in the same sentence as Ed Bars, I consider that a compliment. No um, it, it, a funny story. Uh, many years ago, uh, probably 15 years ago, Ed was at Wilson's Creek doing, leading a tour, and I got to go out with them. I'm like, whoo, all right, cool. You know, Ed asked for me, all right. So I'm out with them. We're walking through the field, in the Ray Cornfield. And in only the way that Ed can, he's, he's talking. He said, all right, uh, General Slaughter. I'm like, what? <laughs> he wanted me to take it from there. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, I had, to, I had to check and make sure I was still, you know, stand, standing on the ground. That was pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Israel Richardson, the one I probably die. Yep, exactly. One more funny story, and I promise I'll stop. Um, Ed was in, at Wilson's Creek, uh, sesquicentennial, <clears throat> and uh, Wide Awake Films was doing some filming of him at Wilson, giving a tour at Wilson's Creek, and then we went down to Newtonia, um, which is just a little south of, of Springfield, two battles of, at Newtonia, 1862-1864, and uh, did the 62 battle, we're doing the 64 battle, it's in the middle of this, what is now a cornfield, it's August, it's hot. Um, so Ed, you know Ed, he's out in the middle of the cornfield doing his, his spiel with his swagger stick and I got a phone call on my cell phone. Uh -oh. So uh, it, it didn't ring, vibrated. Uh, so I stepped away from, from the group back into the shade um, and took the call and took care of business. And that morning he had called me his sergeant major, okay, when we got on the bus. <clears throat> so after my phone call, I stood in the shade while Ed finished. I was demoted to mess cook. <laughs> Thank you all. Y'all have been great. Thank you very much. <laughs>